Water Worlds of the Cosmos, with Sylvia L. Hello and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to explore the ocean worlds of the cosmos. Later in the episode, we'll welcome uh, oceanographer and National Geographic explorer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, back to the show. So let's dive in. Oceans are one of the defining features of our world, covering roughly three quarters of the globe. Water is essential to life on Earth, and at one time we thought this life-sustaining substance was rare throughout the solar system. Over the last few decades, researchers have come to understand that water appears to be far more common throughout the cosmos than ever before believed. One of the four large moons of Jupiter, Europa, is home to vast oceans much larger than those on our home world. Flexing in the crust of Europa caused by the enormous gravitational field of Jupiter creates heating under the frozen surface of this moon. This melts ice, forming subsurface oceans and lakes. The Europa Clipper, the first spacecraft designed solely to explore this intriguing world, is currently scheduled for launch in 2024. Another of the four great moons of Jupiter, Ganymede, is the largest moon in the solar system. Astronomers now believe this satellite could consist of several layers of salt water and ice uh, between its crust and core. Callisto is the third of these Galilean satellites where oceans as deep as those on Earth might reside. However, the oceans of Callisto would likely be hiding beneath 200 kilometers or about 125 miles worth of ice. But Jupiter isn't the only gas giant in our solar system, which is home to moons covered in water. Saturn, holding on to more moons than even mighty Jupiter, is home to Titan. This incredible moon is thought to possibly hold on to a subsurface ocean saltier than the Dead Sea found between Jordan and Israel. Oceans might also be found beneath the frigid surface of Earth, Saturn's sixth largest moon, Enceladus. Jets of water have been seen gushing forth through the 40 kilometer or 25 mile thick layer of ice covering this world. This is thought to be fed by an ocean of liquid water 10 kilometers or six miles deep, as great as that seen here on Earth. Remarkably, even some of the largest asteroids may hold on to their own reservoirs of water, notably Vesta, an asteroid orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. It is probable that at least some of the water on Earth, as well as elsewhere, arrived from space in the form of collisions with asteroids and comets. Our own water world holds on to 326 million trillion gallons of this remarkable liquid. Just 3% of this, though, is fresh water suitable for drinking. Earth is dominated by our global ocean. But today, global climate change, driven by the actions of human beings, threatens life in these oceans in a way never before seen in the history of the human race. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we talk with famed oceanographer and marine biologist, Dr. Sylvia Earle, 
discussing what we can learn about water worlds of the cosmos from the exploration of our oceans here on Earth. We welcome Dr. Sylvia Earle back to the show. She was Time Magazine's first hero for the planet, and she was former chief scientist at NOAA. Welcome back to the show, Sylvia. Oh, glad to be on board. Excellent. Um, and so you've spent decades uh, studying the oceans of Earth, and just what is it that amazes you the most about them? Well, I suppose it starts with water. All life needs water. There's plenty of water, as I'm sure you know, elsewhere in the universe. But nowhere, as far as we know, is there life. Water requires, well, life requires water. Water can live without, or exist without life. Mm -hmm. We're so fortunate to have a planet that is basically blue and makes life possible. But it's taken a very long time for rocks and water filled with life to shape those ingredients into the planet that really works in our favor. I mean, if we went back a billion years, life would be present, but Earth would not be hospitable for us. And the way we're going right now, we're taking this miraculous living system that's just right for us and essentially turning the clock back, you know, putting more CO2 in the atmosphere, destroying the fabric of life. I think if we did not know the problems, we would be in even more serious trouble than we are. Hmm. But we can see the damage we're causing and we know why it matters. And I think we're right on the edge of doing some important restoration work, protection of nature that keeps us alive. That's fabulous. And so there's so many, we're going to talk a little bit about your new book from National Geographic, but what is it? There's so much life down there. What do you, what do you find is some of the most remarkable life you've seen, some of the triumphs of evolution? Well, I think thinking large, looking at the largest creatures on earth, <laughs> the great blue whale, for example, <laughs> and some of the long chains of jellies that are some of the longest forms of life on Earth, and thinking small, looking at the just the, the, the where on Earth are there microbes? It's mm. where the water is. It's in the ocean. And when I first began as a young ocean scientist, it was thought that bacteria and other microbes were kind of rare in the ocean, not very common at least as compared to some places that we knew on the land and in freshwater, but now we know that most of the action is out there in the sea. And right. our new means of detecting life at a micro scale, you know, it wasn't until 1986 that one blue-green bacterium, Prochlorococcus, was discovered using a new technique for looking at the micro creatures in the ocean. Now we know that this little beast, Prochlorococcus, generates perhaps as much as 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. We did not even know it existed. It's so tiny that we had to get the right technology to be able to even detect its presence. But what else is out there, down there, that we, we are still oblivious to its nature that, that is part of the network of life that keeps us alive? Wow, that's so amazing. And so, of course, that leads in, you know, as we go out, there are, you know, water worlds within our own solar system. Mm -hmm. um, Europa um, comes to mind, as does Saturn's moon Enceladus. So what can we learn from the oceans of Earth to help us recognize life, possible life elsewhere? Well, life has a signature. <laughs> you know, we're carbon-based units, if you will. 
<laughs> of the generation of oxygen through photosynthesis, an oxygen-rich atmosphere such as we have is a signature of life. And, you know, it's what sets Earth apart. It's a living ocean. It's not just rocks and water. Hmm. It's the fact that that magical process of replication, the ability to duplicate oneself, to pass genetic information on from one generation to the next. Rocks don't do that. <laughs> hmm. That's true. And um, so, if, you know, there's a spacecraft we already planned for uh, going to Europa called the Europa Clipper, which hopefully be launching in a few years. Mm -hmm. If you could study, if you could have one instrument, the Sylvia Earle instrument <laughs> aboard that craft that would teach you one thing about those oceans, what would, what would you want to have on board? I would, it's not realistic, but... Yep, that's fine. I'm, I'm going for fantasy here. Okay. I would love to have a human being on board because instruments are really good in things that they can do that humans can't. But humans are really good at seeing, drawing on knowledge, expecting the unexpected, being able to act on a hunch, of hmm. being able to really understand what they're seeing not just measuring content or temperature or, or chemicals, but, but really, really going beyond that. I, I mean, Star Trek was pretty good at sorting out the importance of being human. <laughs> and it wasn't all about just emotions and, and empathy and such things. It's our ability to put things together in ways that, we can't program a machine to to do, or at least we haven't yet. Mm. Maybe never. I'd like to think that there's some things that a living system can achieve. That that, that <laughs> we we underrate the simplicity of the human brain mm. or any living thing. It makes the the more we realize the complexity and the the special nature of uh, we carry around on our shoulders, the ability to perceive, to put things together, to ask questions, and be motivated to find out. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to be on, I think that having a, a human <laughs> to be present, to explore, that's what we do best of all, explore. That, yeah, and so do you think that is what fascinates us? so much about the ocean? The unknown? The, the unknown. I think two things. What we know is fascinating, <laughs> and what we don't know is intriguing us. It lures us to keep going, dive deeper, stay longer. These are some of the things that I, I included in Ocean of Global Odyssey, this big book that not only describes what we know about the ocean, but how do we know? How do we know what's out there? How do we understand the nature of subsurface ocean currents? It's one thing to observe from the deck of a ship or high in the sky, but what's underneath? Hmm. It's only in my lifetime that we've gotten increasingly good, better and better, about accessing the depths of the ocean. Still, when you think how many people have been to the top of Mount Everest, hundreds. How many people have been to the deepest place in the ocean? Just over a dozen. Mm -hmm. And most of that has happened in the last two years. I mean, 1960 was the first time that any human went to the deepest part of the ocean and came back. I mean, coming back is part of going. The, the, you know, one-way trips are not really what we're looking for here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. James Cameron went back in 2012. He was the third person. And since then, you know, we're beginning to get it. To, you know, we need to go. We need to send 
instruments and we need to take ourselves not one or the other but both that's fabulous well thanks so much for being on the show sylvia it was great talking with you likewise huh and that was dr sylvia earl um, and her new book ocean a global odyssey is recent now available from national geographic and it's worth keeping on your living room table check it out The Europa Clipper is currently readying to journey to the Jovian system with launch currently scheduled for October 2024. This spacecraft would arrive at Europa in April 2030 when it will begin dozens of passes of the moon searching for terrains where life might exist now or in the past. As the satellite, satellite of Jupiter, around nine-tenths as large as our own moon, orbits its mighty parent, the surface is flexed by the enormous gravitational field of Jupiter, creating heat and melting ice. Europa offers us a unique combination of water, chemistry, and energy, which might possibly be a mixture for the development of life forms unlike any seen on Earth. Even beyond our solar system, astronomers are finding planets rich in water. A Neptune-sized world with the funky name of Hat P 11 b 120 light years from Earth, is known to hold vast amounts of water vapor in a cloudless atmosphere. Planets too close to their sun see their, see their oceans boil away from heat. Those too far away cannot rely on sunlight to melt ice into liquid water. But those at just the right distance from their parent stars could be home to vast oceans of water. In our own system, this habitable zone or Goldilocks zone, where things are neither too hot nor too cold for oceans, Goldilocks, get it? I can't it extends it. roughly from about the orbit of Venus out to Mars. Many of the 5,000 exoplanets currently known sit within this zone, and mathematical models suggest water worlds may be common throughout the Milky Way galaxy. One pair of these exoplanets are Kepler 62e and f, much older than Earth where extraterrestrial life could potentially be billions of years more advanced than our own. It's a while, in it? Water vapor has also been seen in Beta Pictoris, an infant solar system just 20 million years old. Astronomers have recently found 30 comets, basically dirty snowballs in space in this young solar system. Water worlds of the future may be forming in Beta Pictoris right now to be explored by future generations of astronomers. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion as we talk about our own moon. We have a lunar eclipse happening on the night of the 15th of May and we're going to tell you all about it, so make sure to join us then. Visit us anytime at thecosmiccompanion.tv Please subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends, family, co-workers, your innies, outies, whatever works. Please try to enjoy all episodes equally. Clear skies.